Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Jim Cobray. Before you sit down, let's just take care of this issue right off the bat. There's just a bunch of you right now that need to get right with God. You know, that really means, how do I get right with God? First of all, you've got to acknowledge you're not right with God. You know, one of the funny things is everybody thinks they're okay with God because God loves them. Because God loves you doesn't mean you're okay with God. Jesus comes to a guy by the name of Nicodemus, really much better guy than all of us. I mean, this guy was like great lifestyle. He was leader of his church, fed the poor, memorized scripture, quoted scripture, debated scripture. How about this one, sang the scripture? How many of you have been singing scripture lately? I mean, this guy's really a good guy. I would have thought for sure he would have said, you know, Nicodemus, you're going to love heaven. Heaven's waiting for you. You've done such a great job here on earth. But he doesn't, doesn't say that. He comes to Nicodemus and he says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. No matter how much scripture he knew, no matter how much he'd been in church, no matter how many people he had fed, no matter how religious he was in his lifestyle, Jesus makes a statement to this guy that was probably better in his lifestyle than all of us. You must be born again. Most people that attend American churches really don't know anything about being born again. All they know is they've heard what the media says and television and Hollywood and magazines and movies where they portray born again people as idiots and fools and radicals and just crazier than can be. And that's not what Jesus is talking about when he said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Here's what he was talking about. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, you ever wonder why this is so thick and has so much to say? Because God is trying to get something simple across to all of us. And the simplicity of it is that it's all about your heart. And it's your heart, not your neighbors, not your friends, not this world's. It's not even God's heart that you have until you give God all of your heart, until you give God all of your life. And that's what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It means you've given God all of your heart, given God all of your life. And you have to give it to him because God's not a thief to rob your heart and life. It's like he gives you a free will choice. I mean, if God wanted to, is it not true the one who created the heavens and the earth set the moon in its right axis? You know, the one that sets the stars in their place, who sets the sun at a right distance, or we'd burn up or freeze to death if it wasn't precisely where it needs to be? The one who sets that, don't you think he could make robots to serve him? He, He could do it all day long. He could make a billion robots just like you. But he doesn't. He makes you and gives you a free will choice to see whether or not you will choose to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. Now watch this, watch this. If you haven't yet done that, I don't care how nice you are, smart you are, cute you are, talented or gifted you are, whether you go to church on Easter or Christmas, I don't care if you think Jesus is the Son of God. Can I tell you something? Even the devil knows and thinks Jesus is the Son of God. He's not going to heaven and he's not right with God. So it's not what you have in your head, it's what you've done with your heart. And tonight before we go any further, there's a lot of you in here that need to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. In doing so, you'll be right with God. And, and in doing so, that's when you're born again and that's when you belong to God and your heart belongs to God and then God can start working on the inside of you and change you from the inside out. But until you Submit your heart and life to Jesus and give it all. You know, this is not a fraction. I'm going to tell you like it really is. This is not some a little here and a little there, a little dabble, do you type thing. You know, I'll, I'll give, I'll give uh, Jesus my Sunday, but the next six days of the week are mine. This is everything, all, all. It is a radical all or nothing 
all or nothing desire that you have to have. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, Jesus is speaking, the book of Revelation. Jesus said, I'm coming again. You know he is. And he says, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. What a crazy statement. Jesus says he'll vomit us from his mouth only if you're lukewarm. What did he just really say? People who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm, half in, half out, a little up, a little down, token prayer. Jesus is something, but he's not everything. He's just something in your life. Guess what? That's lukewarm. And he says people that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all, not right with God, and he will vomit them out of his mouth. That's a shock. And tonight, here it is, Easter 2014. I believe there's a great weekend ahead of all of us. But tonight, before we go any further, there's a bunch of you that need to grab your hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible. A friend, if you need to have a friend, just grab your friend next to you and say, come on, I need to go give my heart and life to Jesus. And I want you to get out of your seat. Yeah, this is weird, I know. But it's weird that Jesus will walk a beaten, bloody mess to Calvary for you and die so that you could live. And if that's weird, man, then it's also weird for you to get out of your seat, get in the aisle, and meet me right here in front. And there's a bunch of you. And God wants to do something in your life and in your future. But you're going to have to submit. You're going to have to give up you. You're going to have to give God you. All of your heart and all of your life. It's that simple. We'll pray a prayer. You can be right with God tonight before we go any further. And you can enjoy what God has in this church service tonight. Because you know we're going to talk about a subject that is absolutely phenomenal from the Word of God. We're going to teach you how to get a hold of the prosperous life that God wants for you. And it's never, ever, ever going to work for you until you're right with God first. So those of you that know that I'm speaking to you, get out of your seat right now. Just push your way out. Don't worry about spilling someone's popcorn. You're not in a movie theater. Get in the aisle and meet me right here in front. You just come on. Stop messing with God and you come right now. Come on. Just come. That's it. They're coming from everywhere. Come on. You can come too. Don't look at them. I'm looking at you. God's looking at you. You know I'm talking about you. Get up here right now. Come on. Come on, push your way out and let's go for God. You didn't come here to play games. You came here because you want to go for God. And you know it. And it starts with giving God all of your heart and starts with giving God all of your life. You come right now. Come on. Come on. You come right now. Come on. All over this place, you just come. Man, I just know there's like, there's like 25 more of you. I just know that you need to come. I just know it. I can feel you all over this place. You're saying to yourself right now, you're saying, I wonder if I should. Mm -hmm. And that's you, isn't it? So guess what? God just told on you, get up here. Come on. I'm gonna give you just a moment or two. They're still coming. While people are still coming, you come. Just don't go another moment without giving your heart and life to Jesus. Out of the family rooms, you can bring your kids and come. Very important. Listen, here's what I'm saying. If Jesus can walk a beaten, bloody mess down the streets of Jerusalem and hang on that cross, that bloody old cross for you, You can walk a safe aisle for him. And if you can't, listen to this, and if you can't and you feel like you can't do that, then guess what? You will never live for him outside the walls of the church. You might as well just face up to it. You might as well just go on over. You won't make it. But tonight is your night to get past that. Get out of yourself 
and get up here. And you know it, and it's you. And I'm going to give you just a moment more, and then you're going to miss this. So you come right now. Come on. You come right now. Pastor Joel, come on over here. And I want you to wave at these people. This is all, everybody in the front, wait, look here, over here. This is Pastor Joel, and he's waving at you. He's a good guy. He's going to pray with you. No weird stuff goes on. Going to give you some free stuff to take home now that you're a Christian, because in a minute you're going to be a Christian. You only had it up here before, but now you're going to have it here, and that's the difference. And guess what? Now you're going to be a Christian. He's going to tell you what to do next. Is that okay? So it only takes a few moments. I want you to make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Because he's the great teacher of the church. So we don't come into the house of God to hear from a man. We come into the house of God to, to hear from the things of the Lord. In the word of the Lord. I want you to stay seated, but I want you to bow your heads and let's go for prayer. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. And before you in this congregation and the heavenly hosts of heaven, I bow my knees before you, Lord, and say as a humble servant that we desperately need you tonight. We desperately need you tomorrow. We desperately need you throughout the entire week. And we desperately need you for the months ahead and the years ahead. And God, we give you the praise and glory. Thank you, Lord, that you're building us from the inside out. There's something you're doing on the inside of us. And God will give you the praise. And we thank you now, Holy Spirit. Welcome, touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us. Direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to do, Lord, and we'll give you the praise and glory. Bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for a mighty move of your spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said amen. amen. The journey into a prosperous life. This is part number three. We made some statements last time, and I want you just to hear them because they're really important statements. If you read the Bible, you will find out that God really wants to prosper you. Wants to take his children to a prosperous place. Wants to bless them in every area of their life. I never heard that in church in my life. I heard that God loves me, but I... Never really heard that God wants to prosper me. But let's define prosperity so that we're not goofy and going off the walls and making crazy mistakes. Prosperity is not just the money in your wallet or in your bank account or the money that you earn that you spend, even though it is part of that, certainly part of that. Prosperity is... When you're abundant in life, in every area of your life, with your family, your home, your children, dreams, vision, destiny, purpose, you're abundant in your lifestyle. And that's real prosperity. In fact, someone was telling me something about their kids the other day, and it just so blessed me to hear how their kids are serving God. And I looked at them and I said, you know, now that's real prosperity a lot of people don't talk about. But he's not excluding money. So somebody say, thank God. Because I know you can use more money. There's anybody in here that wouldn't like to have more money. So you say this, and I've been saying this last couple of weeks. This is the third week. It's kind of interesting. If God really wants to prosper us, and we see all kinds of examples of that in Scripture. You see it with the life of David. You see it with the life of Joseph. You see it with the children of Israel taking them into the promised land. You see all these great things taking place. Even in the New Testament, people are prosperous in the New Testament. And so these, so for us to, to look at life and say that God doesn't want to prosper us, we would be foolish in understanding the scripture. But the big question is, like I've said the last couple of weeks, if God wants to prosper us, why doesn't he? 
I mean, hasn't there anybody in here that hasn't said, come on, God, I could use a little bit more money. What, am I going to break some eternal plan? Why is it you can't do something to help? A little bit is not going to break the, break the bank of heaven. Help me out a little bit here. Why doesn't he do it? It's really fascinating because oftentimes we'll find that the blessings or the prosperity that a person has is directly tied to the very character of that person. Let me say it again. The prosperity or the lack of prosperity that a person has or doesn't have is directly tied to the very character of that person. In other words, let me give you an example of that. If, um, let's say for an example, uh, someone who got blessed, the blessing turns into a curse. The abundance of finances are not able to be handled. And all of a sudden, the most important thing in your life becomes second to what you have. In other words, a lot of times we'll find people who start to get a little bit prosperous in the church. They come to the church broke, hunger, thirsting for the things of God, wanting God. They're really sincere. And then all of a sudden, God starts to bless them. I've seen it over and over and over again. They just have everything. That man is like they, the, the Midas touches on them. And the doors open up and the blessings start to flow. And then all of a sudden, that which should be most important becomes second and third and fourth and something else becomes more important than God. And the character defeats the purpose that God has and the desire that God has to prosper his people. Wow. And so what we're talking about is the development of a character so that you and I can handle the blessings that God has for us in our life. I thought what was fascinating last time we were together, we were in the book of Ezekiel. The great prophet Ezekiel was writing, and he made a statement. And when he made a statement, he made a statement about the children of Israel right as they were about ready to go into the, in fact, they were already uh, in captivity when he made the statement, but he was explaining to them why they got into captivity. In other words, what was it that brought them to a place where God just lifted his hands and said, okay, uh, the king of Babylon never Nebuchadnezzar, he can have you and take you into captivity. What was it? And here it was in a time of prosperity, a time of abundance, a time where they had all the good things. You'll find out, like I said last week, that God will never judge you when you're down and out. He doesn't kick a dog when he's down. He doesn't uh, break a reed that's, uh, that's broken. He doesn't, he's not here to snap your back and put you in a problem. But guess what? When you start to prosper, that really shows the character of a person as to what choices and decisions that's when they start to make. Did you know that most people fail because of a little prosperity that they get they show their true colors. Do you know what I mean by that? And all of a sudden, the very character of someone is spoiled and their relationship with God is spoiled. Did you know why? Because they fail the character issue because a little bit of prosperity goes to their head, goes to their pride, goes to all kinds of things, goes to their satisfaction of the flesh, and they find themselves doing something that's contrary to the ways of God. And all of a sudden, the blessing became a curse. And it's a character issue. And you can come to church, and this is going to shock you. Can I just shock, shock you for a moment? You've probably never in a million years heard a preacher say this, so let me say it to you by being honest. You can come to church and give all your money and still die broke and busted. Because it's not about the money you give. It's about the heart behind the money you give. It's not the amount of money that comes from your wallet. It's the amount of of love and heart and belief and faith that, that's from your heart. Yeah. And this is really all about your heart, and that's what governs the character. I mean, so many times, you know, I'll, I'll run into people, and they will marry somebody, and, and they were great together at the beginning, and then all of a sudden they fail as they go down the road together, and you say, why did that happen? Somewhere along the line, the character issue came out and just spoiled them. Ruin the whole thing. Some of you have been that way in your walk with Jesus. You said to yourself, what happened? Why, what, the character issue wasn't strong enough to hold you in place and to keep on going. And so without the character being proper, what we do is we fail. 
And God will start to bless you as you go to church and as you start to get the word, as you start to pray and you start to believe God, you start to have a heart for him. He'll start to bless you just to see what you're going to do in that little blessing. And most people even fail in the little blessing. That's really fascinating. Let me just talk to you, if I may, just a moment. Uh, and let me share this verse with you, if I can. I think it's a great verse, if, if I can, if I can uh, uh, check it out with you. It's, uh, well, let's do this. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to skip that verse because of time and just go somewhere. I want to I talk to you about holding unto God his way. Holding on to God his way. Now, wait a minute. You say, what the heck does that mean, Pastor Jim? You can hold on to God your way and miss God. Have you ever been around someone and said, I've got God? And you know they don't have anybody, they don't have any relationship with God at all. I am good with God and God loves me. Man, there's no doubt God loves you. But it's whether you love him. And you can hold on to God your way and miss his way and never really be holding on to God. So you've got to hold on to God his way. I can hold on to God and say, boy, I'm holding on to God. I'm doing this, this, and this. And it's not the things God wants me to do, so what good is it? I can hold on to God with, with uh, my character so far, but as soon as I get to a certain place, I let go of God and start doing something else. I can hold on to God until I'm no longer in fear, and then when I start to fear a little bit, I lose God. In order to hold on to God, you're going to have to hold on to God God's way in order to develop the heart that brings forth the character. Is anybody listening? So important for us to see. I've got three things that God spoke to me in a five-minute period of time this morning. I've been thinking all week long, have 10 different messages. And in five minutes, God gave me three things with three fascinating verses. Are you ready? Because I want to just share with you, holding on to God His way. Number one. Make God unforgettable. Come on, give me your attention. They'll take care of that. Make God unforgettable. Now, I want you to know something. All week long, I've been tormented with the Spirit of God speaking to me, saying these words, the root of every man's failure is because they forgot. They forgot what it was when God touched them. They forgot what it was when God healed them. They forgot what it was when God brought them a blessing. They forgot what God did for them when God ministered to them and met their needs. They forgot what it was when they got answers to prayer. They forgot what it was when God delivered them. They forgot what it was. They forget all the time. We are a people that forget. And I have to every day work at not forgetting. I won't let myself get into a routine. Did you know, let me make a statement to you. Every person that's ever left the Rock Church and World Outreach Center forgot what the place in their life while they were here. That God touched them and God healed them and God strengthened them and God took them from here to here. They just went on life and forgot where they came from. And oftentimes that's where we're at. We forget and you have to make God unforgettable. Every day, if there's anything I can say about Deborah and I, as old people now, if you want to call us old, you can call us old if you want because we know how to take offense. <laughs> this is that we work at never forgetting the things that God did for us. The miracles that took place, the expressions on how God came through, the healings that took place in our life. 
Because if you forget those things and all of a sudden you take God back to a very common thing where he's no longer very important to you. And from time to time, we will get into a situation, we can feel the pressure of the world on us, and we'll stop and say, yes, but do you remember when? Yes, do you remember when? In the book of Hebrews, I think it's the 10th chapter, it says, remember the victories of the past. We need to be a people who remember the victories of the past. If you forget the victories of the past, you will have no future with God. Let me say it again. If you forget the victories of the past, you will have no future with God. And for every single one of us, we have to fight. We have to make him unforgettable. Amen. See, but a lot of times, you know, we, we, we say, God healed me then. I don't even remember, but today's a new day. Instead of saying, wow, it's amazing what God did for me then. And living off of what he has done, how many times has he touched your life? You've got to make him unforgettable. If there's anything that's kept Debbie and I in there, it's the fact that we have never forgotten. We never forgot where we came from. We never forgot who we really are. We never forgot where we were doing. We never forgot the hand of God that touched us, that took us and did something with us. We have never forgot the greatness of God. Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. Let's just pop it up on the overhead. It's one of the verses that God gave me to give to you. It's kind of a, really an interesting verse. First of all, let me just give you a mindset of Deuteronomy. Here's a 120-year-old Moses writing to the people that are going next generation into the promised land, into success, into prosperity. That's what we're talking about for you. Are you following me? And here's Moses, 120 years old, before he dies off, and he is writing this letter to them, telling them what he, they should do as they go into the promised land, what kind of a lifestyle. Because, see, when God's with you, he will prosper you. When he sees the character that's on the inside of you. Verse number 10 says, so it shall be, that when the Lord your God brings you into the land in which I swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build. I'm talking about prosperity here. They're not talking about giving you a house. They're not saying, I'm bringing you into a shack. This is a shack pack down the street you get to go in and drop down in and you get, a, here's this large and beautiful, I don't know about you, when God says it's large and beautiful, I have to believe it must have been. Amen. How do you describe it? Here's how you describe it. Amen. Everybody do that when they go. <laughs> Let's try that again. Everybody go. There's somebody got a nasal problem over there. <laughs> that you did not build, verse number 11. Watch this. Houses full of good things. And anybody, anybody say, ooh, that's for me. Okay. Wait a minute. I, I thought God didn't want you to have anything. Houses full of good things, which you did not fill Hewned out wells, that means dug out wells, which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees. See, that's the only wealth they had in those days. There was no money exchanged. They exchanged goods. And which you did not plant. And when you have eaten and are, are full, verse number 12, then beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You know, what we do is we forget all the time who we are, where we came from, and what God's done. It's almost like, God, if you don't do a trick for me every day, then I'll find a new dog. And it ought not to be that way. It's all we have to do is remember and never forget. You know, when you remember when you walked in the house of God, that's why a lot of times we come into the house of God, you know, God's going to do some great things. If, if, if I'm expecting God to do something today, I sometimes need him to do something for me in the past so I can have the faith for today. 
And some of you are walking up and wanting something from God today, and you just need to remember if God did it then, he can do it now. Is anybody listening? So important for us to be a people that we make God unforgettable. Second thing, in order for us to be holding on to God, if I'm going to hold on to God, i got to hold on to him his way. So I hold on to him, and I'm not forgetting. But I love this next one. We've got to make God bigger. Now, let me just say something to you. If God is only as big as what you see, then your seeing makes God bigger. He's got to be bigger than what you see. I'll give you a case point. Joseph had to see God bigger than the problem he was in being sold off to slavery and being there and year after year after year in an Egyptian slave because he knew God had spoken to him that they will bow down before you. You're going to be a great place of authority. And he hadn't see the surroundings. He's in a prison. He saw what God said. God is always bigger than what you see with your eyes. For an example, if you come up here today and you want to be healed, oh my goodness, and you walk back and say, well, I didn't get my healing. I didn't get my healing. It won't be long for you don't get your healing. you got to see God bigger than what takes place today. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Jesus curses the fig tree. The next day they come back. When he cursed the fig tree, the fig tree didn't change. It didn't die. It was only the next day that they came back and saw the fig tree. So they probably walked away and said, man, he may be the Messiah, but he missed that one. Because their eyes said, hey, he cursed it and it didn't die. Well, it didn't shrivel up in front. A day later, it shrivels up. And a lot of times, we've got our eyes on today instead of the great God that's involved tomorrow. And you've got to make him bigger every day than what you see. I see myself only going so far with only so much energy and so much time. And may I say something to you? I don't see that in the natural. I see with the supernatural, and therefore my God is bigger than my limitations physically. Come on, somebody. And when you start to get into this and you start to believe God for something, you've got to start believing God for something bigger than what you see. If you're limited to what you see, you'll never see it. Because when you start to see with the eyes of faith, that's when it starts to manifest. Is anybody listening? There's this cool verse in Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter. In verse 15, it's kind of a weird little verse. Let me get there in Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter. And it's a weird little verse, but it says so much. Verse 15. Now he's talking about the people going into the promised land and, and the ones who failed and one who didn't fail and things such as that. But watch this. But Jeshurun, that's his name, Jeshurun, grew fat and kicked. Now someone says, wait a minute, what the world? Why would God, Jeshurun, here's your picture. You have a mental picture of someone fat and kicking. Is that what God's talking about? No. Here's what it means. <laughs> God is not prejudiced with fat people. Thank God. He makes this statement. And Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. In other words, he was rich and he was obstinate. He was kicking against things all the time. He was complaining, crabbing out. Ever been around somebody negative all the time? He says, and you grew fat. And you grew thick. You are obese. Well, he's not talking about fat people. He's talking about people who have gotten so abundance and wealth. 
Then he forsook God. Wait a minute. Then he for then he when he was fat and kicking against the things of God. Then he forsook God, who made him, and scornfully esteemed the rock of his salvation. Now you got to get this in the Old King James. Let me pop up the Old King James because it says it's so cool in the Old King James. It says it like this. He says. For, uh, he says. And Jeshurun waxed or grew fat, kicked. Thou art grown fat, thou art grown thick, and you, and you covered with fatness. In other words, you're just so wealthy. Then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. All of a sudden, he sees God as small and unimportant, and all of a sudden, in his wealth, he now starts to see God is not as important as when he was in need. You and I have got to always make God, mm, I love this, bigger. Not esteem him as less because of your wealth and your prosperity. People come, get blessed. Man, they don't have a job, they don't have anything. Let me tell you something, they'll sit in church for six months, they'll hear the word of God, they'll get excited, they'll meet me at the back door, shake my hand, I can't get them off the fourth row, the third row, the second row, they can hardly wait to get there. Then all of a sudden they get the job, all of a sudden they get some finances, and the God that was so big in their life, all of a sudden down the road, God is something else, somewhere else, they esteemed him Listen to this, lightly, and they're in the middle row, and then they're in the back row, and then they're, and then they're not around at all anymore because they were satisfied with their fat. <laughs> if you're going to prosper, you're going to have to understand the character that goes with it. So that God can truly prosper you and not lose your position with God. My last one that God spoke to me, which was just amazing, and it's my favorite of all of them, is this we're talking about holding onto God His way. And I love this maintain a healthy fear of your personal failure. Now, that doesn't sound like the rock. Yes, it is. Maintain a healthy fear of your personal failures. What does that mean? That means if I don't have God, I will fail. That's what it means. Deborah and I are what we are, whatever that is, because if we don't have God, we will fail. If Deborah went back to drugs, we'd fail. If I went back to whatever it was I was in, I, would, I am so desperate for God that without God, I fail. And I've got to remember that every day. Pornography comes by, no, -uh. I'm not letting that get into my life. I have a relationship with Jesus. Drugs come by, no, no, you're not getting around me with that. I got a relationship with Jesus. I, I, my personal failure, I can't afford to do that. Because if I do that, my, I know my personal failure would kick in and it's all over. And if I don't have an awareness of my personal failure and think I'm all that and I can't fail, that's when you will fail. Because without God, we all fail. No matter who you are, it starts with just a, a little nothing and all of a sudden, I don't care how positive you are, you better be positive about who God is, not about you. Because you without God equals failure. But you with God equals victory. Real quick, I'm just going to give you a verse and 
Proverbs, the writer of Proverbs is just so amazing. It's kind of a, when you get there, it just, it just, it says so much about the proverb. You know who the writer is? Had a few bucks. Proverbs, the 30th chapter. And he writes these things that are, I found fascinating when I read them. When I first read them, I didn't quite understand what God was saying to me. And then all of a sudden, it just jumped out at the page, starting in verse number seven. Two things, he petitions God. Two things I request of you. Notice the capital Y on the word you, meaning God. Deprive me not before I die. These two things. Remove falsehoods, verse 8, and lies far from me. And then he makes a statement. Here's what the writer says. He says, give me neither poverty nor riches. I mean, that in itself, like, threw me off. Here's, here's this writer, one who is obviously incredibly wealthy, and he says, give me poverty or riches. He says, neither poverty or riches. I don't want either one of them. If either one of them are going to take me from you, is what he's saying. I don't want either one of them. If either one of them are going to take me from you, because the truth is simply this. Without God, we are broke. The saddest of all human beings that would walk upon the planet is you and I without God. No matter how much you accumulate, no matter how successful you are, no matter how many Fortune 500 corporations you run, may I say something to you? Without God, you will fail. And let me tell you something. I much rather have poverty or wealth. Don't even give them to me if it takes me away from the things of God. That's what he's saying in that verse. <laughs> Feed me with the food allotted to me. In other words, just give me what it takes to exist. But then the next verse comes on, which is fascinating. Least I be full and deny you. In other words, I have so much, I don't, I think of myself and I don't need you anymore. <laughs> which is exactly the character that most humans possess. Least I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? In other words, I have even forgotten who you are. Or at least I be poor and have to steal and profane the name of God. In other words, I don't want anything that'll keep me from you. The most important, the Bible makes it very clear that your portion, you will never be rich in material things in this world until you understand what your portion is. Your portion is Jesus Christ. And when you realize that you have Jesus and he's your portion and you're satisfied with him and you are in with him, then the rest of the stuff, he says, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and then these things will be added on to you. Amen. But it's got to be him first. Yes. So the writer here is not saying keep me broke and he's not saying make me rich. What he's really saying is simply this. Anything that would keep me from you, I don't want. So that's not the attitude I want either. I want the attitude where I can get blessed by God and stay in there with God. And if I'm warned and know and understand and have any kind of a brain at all, therefore when material things are added onto my life, I realize they're only there for the gospel's sake and I don't have to let it go to my head. The only head I really have is him. And without that head, you don't have anything else. Is anybody listening? And we've messed this whole thing up all along. And we wonder why Christians, you know, have you ever noticed something about Christians? For the most part, they don't have much. I mean, bottom line, going to a church, almost all churches except maybe some areas, but then they have no relationship with God probably in a lot of ways. 
They just have a religion. Maybe, I don't know, I'm not their judge. But if you ever go into a church, a lot of times you'll find that most people that call themselves Christians don't have much. And the reason for that is because there's a character issue. And if the character isn't right, God can't bless you. Tonight he talks about three characteristics that we can all work on. Number one, make God unforgettable. And I love this. Make God bigger, and then you might as well put it in parentheses, than you see. Because he's, until he becomes bigger than you see, he will never be big in your heart at all. And the third one is stop and don't forget and remember these issues to maintain a healthy fear of your own personal failures. In other words, God, I must rather not have anything if it would keep me from you. But seeing it's not going to keep me from you, then I'm going to receive it to the glory of God. Is anybody listening? I'm in part three, and I have a whole lot of more parts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you that I'm going to take a little break and then come back to part four. You're just going to have to come to church and find out when that is. Because if you got something from God, you know how we do around here. You got to give God the praise. Come on, somebody. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.